before Plato. We have three lectures on Plato because Plato deserves it, being as great a great mind as any of them is. Well, we talked about true being or metaphysics in the last lecture. Now we'll talk about a connected notion, a related notion, the true self, the soul, right? Plato gives us a way of thinking about the deep layers of the self that is connected to his way of thinking about the deep or high or true nature of being. So there's a connection between metaphysics, or the study of true being, and psychology, which is the study of the soul, the study of the psyche, which is Greek for soul. So psychology in ancient thought meant a philosophical study of the soul. So here we are looking at Plato's psychology. And Plato is in many ways the most influential psychologist of the Western tradition because he gave us what is still one of the dominant ways of thinking about the nature of the soul and indeed the nature of the human self. Plato was the first dualist. I think he probably was. He seems to have invented this form of thought. Dualism, that is, the notion that the human self divides cleanly in two parts, soul and body. Seems obvious, doesn't it? But it wasn't obvious to anyone before Plato. In Homer, for instance, who was the great Greek poet before Plato, the human self would divide into quite a number of parts, not just two. There wouldn't be a, a sort of mental half over here called soul and a physical half over here called body. The, the terms for psychological functions might include heart, spirit, breath, or spirit. Breath and spirit were the same word, right? You could translate the same word pneuma as breath or spirit. Uh, liver, kidneys. The same thing, by the way, with the Old Testament. Kidneys is an Old Testament word uh, for something like guts, uh, bowels of compassion is a New Testament phrase, which comes from Hebrew ways of talking. But both the Hebrew ways of talking in the Old Testament and the ancient Greek ways of talking before Plato had this whole range of terms which overlapped, right? Your heart and your spirit covered part of the same aspects of yourselves. Your spirit included your breath. Uh, for Hebrew, your soul included your neck. It's literally the word for neck. Uh, your guts included both your physical guts and, and how you feel in your gut. Your heart included both your physical heart and how you feel in your heart. So you didn't have this notion of a clean bifurcation or division of the self into two parts, soul and body, mental and physical. That seems like an obvious division to us, but that's because Plato lived and wrote and thought. And if he hadn't, we might not find it so obvious. So this is what happens when you have a great mind. You end up thinking the way you do here in the 20th century, in part because of the way he did two and a half millennia ago. So how do we end up getting this picture of the human self divided into two? It starts with a concern for the immortality of the soul, which is the key theme in Plato's middle dialogue, the Phaedo, P-H-A-E-D-O, Phaedo. The Phaedo is set on the last day of Socrates' life. In this, this middle dialogue, as in the early Socratic dialogues, Socrates is the main character. But instead of this sort of uh, question and answer which leads to perplexity, in the Phaedo, Socrates has a point to make. He's actually trying to prove a point. He's trying to show that the soul is immortal. But he's also trying to help his students or followers see it for themselves. And indeed, he's trying to comfort them because they're in great grief. They're, their teacher is going to die. He's about to drink the hemlock, which is, means he's going to get executed. Um, and they know this, and Socrates knows this, and Socrates is very calm about it. Socrates isn't afraid of death, but all of his students are. So he, in order to comfort them, he tries to show them that the soul is immortal. Now, this is not so obvious as it might seem because in Homer, for instance, the soul is exhaled in the last breath of a, of a dying warrior. You have this scene many times in, in Homer's poems where you know, the spear goes through a man's heart, he breathes his last, the soul goes out of the mouth and gets scattered on the wind, scattered and gone. 
And maybe it goes to this dark place called Hades where it lives a kind of shadow existence. Maybe it gets scattered on the wind. Homer doesn't have a consistent theology about that. But Socrates' pupils in this dialogue, the Phaedo, are worried that that's what's going to happen to the soul. Right? Out it goes in the last breath. Right? Because after all, after the last breath, there's no soul in the body. There's no life in the body. Right? So, so the, last breath, the last breath must have carried the soul out of the body and, what, scattered it on the wind? Right? So if the soul is immortal, we're going to have to have a different picture of the nature of the soul than this. The soul is going to have to be made of something other than breath or blood or several other alternative possibilities. And it's going to have to have a destiny, a direction, a home that is different from the breath or the heart or any other material home. So, in fact, the key notion in the Phaedo is that the soul is somehow connected with the forms, the things that we heard about in the last lecture. The soul is somehow connected with, or Plato will say, kin to the forms, the unchanging, deathless, eternal forms. The soul in some way belongs with what is deathless, unchanging, eternal, and true. The soul has a, a place to go after death that is not just Hades, which is a, this mythological sort of underworld where sh shades and shadows and basically a place of ghosts. Right? That's one version of the soul, which Plato does not want that kind of immortality. He, he's not talking about ghosts. He's talking about a soul that belongs among true being, eternal being, in the light, not in the darkness, not in a cave underground. So the soul is kin to the forms. That's the key notion in the Phaedo. The soul has an identity and a destiny that's not situated in this bodily world. The soul is, in fact, not fundamentally at home in the body. Hence, Socrates in this dialogue will say that true philosophy, true philosophizing, means practicing to die. Because what happens when you die is your soul gets separated from your body, right? And the soul is not at home in the body. The soul wants to go back where it belongs, which is with the forms, right? The soul doesn't want to be among things that die, and the body certainly dies. But the soul wants to be with things that are deathless, like the forms. The soul is akin, more akin to these deathless and eternal things than it is to the mortal, changing, decaying body. So what we have here in the Phaedo is the origin of a tradition of what you could call otherworldliness. Right? The soul is not at home in the bodily world. The soul belongs in a more eternal and deathless and changeless world. That's what you have to say, I think, in order to have a notion of, of the soul as inherently immortal. Because nothing in the changing world of bodies is immortal. So if the soul is immortal, it has to have some kind of different nature and destiny, different home than the body. So Plato wants us to think of ourselves as not so much at home in our bodies. Indeed, he wants us to practice for the separation of the soul and the body. He calls that a form of purification. The soul needs to be purified of its attachment to the body. Now think of the implications. If detaching yourself from the body, separating yourself from the body, means purification, that means the body isn't really pure, is it? The body is sort of like a form of dirt. Right? After all, think of what a body is without a soul. Right? Last breath goes, soul is gone. What's, what kind of thing is that? That's a corpse. It's, it's as dirty as you get. Right? People don't like handling corpses. Right? It's not just in Judaism, but th throughout world religions, corpses are unclean. Right? They get very unclean after a few days. Right? We wrinkle up our noses at them. Right? The soul wants to be separated from that, Plato thinks. The soul wants to be purified from that. And if the soul gets too involved in bodily things, this is a form of impurity. If the soul gets too involved in bodily pleasures, that's a form of impurity. But also in money and other material things, as we say. Right? If the soul gets involved in these material things, it gets, it gets uh, dirtied by these things. It gets nailed to the body, Plato will say, in the Phaedo. 
Right? This is Socrates speaking as a mouthpiece for Plato, because the, the views in the Phaedo are probably Plato's, not, not Socrates' original views. So the soul becomes this thing that, that, that gets nailed to the body by its, by its pleasures and pains, its, uh, its material interests. The body is like a form of dirt. The body is a prison, Plato will call it, for the soul. Right? The soul doesn't want to be there. It's not home there. That's why the true philosopher, the true seeker after wisdom, is practicing to die, practicing for the separation of the body from the soul. The true philosopher is, as one would later say, an ascetic, right? Uh, uh, someone who's disciplining the soul to separate itself from bodily pleasures. I'm, I'm, I'm stressing this a little one-sidedly because this is not all there is that Plato has to say about the soul. But in the Phaedo, it's the dominant theme, and it, it really is a form of otherworldliness that becomes very important in Neoplatonism and other later religious forms of thought. Now, another step in Plato's argument for the immortality of the soul, which we need to now throw into the mix, not only is the soul kin to the forms, but the soul comes into the body with some knowledge of the forms already. That is to say, when we get to see the forms in this life, right, when we're still in the body, that seeing is like a form of recollection. Think of it, first of all, the experience, right? Here you are in the math class, you're trying to figure out this proof, you don't get it for a while, but then all of a sudden you get it. You figure it out. Aha, I see it, now I understand it. And it seems like something that's always been there, right? You say to yourself, oh, how could I have missed it? Of course, in a sense, I always knew it. I, you, you recognize it, you recognize it. It's, it's like, oh yeah, of course, that's obvious. It should have been obvious to me all along. It feels a little bit like remembering, Plato thinks. It's like recollecting something that you already knew but had forgotten. Because what happens is the soul sort of gets into the body when you're born, and the, the body is what? An infant body. Mind, it's, it's not set up for knowledge. And you forget. Right? Birth is a forgetting. And all learning is a form of recollection. So the soul gets into the body at birth, and it, it has a form of amnesia. And when you learn to actually see the forms, this is a, the opposite of amnesia, it's anamnesis, uh, which is recollection. Right? All learning is recollection. And as you can see, this means that, of course, the soul did not start out in the body. After all, it's not at home there. The soul had a, a, an existence prior to, be, to coming in the body. Although the story here is a little bit complicated. Let me first give the early version of the story uh, from... Plato's dialogue, the Mino, which is also referred to in the Phaedo. This is a version of transmigration, or what many of us will call reincarnation, right? The, 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 our souls were embodied in a previous life, um, and therefore they could learn about the forms and then get re-embodied in our present life, but forget during their childhood and then relearn when they have uh, education and so on. But that is kind of mythological. And in fact, Plato refers to certain uh, myths that were circulating at the time. Plato likes to use myth to try to elucidate deep truths that are hard to explain. Uh, deep, deep truths that uh, don't maybe um, yield themselves very successfully to the Socratic method of question and answer. If he doesn't have time to go through that question and answer, he'll tell a myth. One of the myths he'll tell about is, is transmigration. But it doesn't really work as an explanation of recollection. Because if... Every time I learn about a form or, or catch a glimpse of the, these true forms, right, these, this true being in the, in the true world where the light is really shining, remember the allegory of the cave, if every time I ca catch a glimpse of that, what I'm really doing is remembering something I learned before in a previous life, then how did I learn it in that previous life? By recollecting from a life before that, and then recollecting from a life before that, and on into infinity? Eh, no, that doesn't explain it, right? So, Plato comes up in another dialogue with a more sophisticated but equally mythic explanation. This is the dialogue called Phaedrus, like Phaedo but spelled differently at the end. F, uh, P -H -E -P -H -A -E -D -R -U -S, sorry. P-H-A-E-D, just like Phaedo, and then R-U-S, Phaedrus. Now, in this dialogue, the soul starts out not embodied in some previous life, but rather disembodied, right? Because after all, the real home of the soul, its real origin, is not among bodies at all. Right? The soul is imprisoned in a body, so the prison can't be where it belongs. It belongs in a disembodied state, 
uh, contemplating heavenly truths. Now this is again mythic, like the allegory of the cave, like the transmigration story. This is a, a, an allegorical kind of metaphorical story. But Plato pictures the soul as up in heaven, literally up in heaven, uh, and contemplating things that are beyond the heavens. The, the Greek astronomy had, a, had the heavens as a kind of sphere surrounding the world, and up at the top of the sphere you could look out beyond the whole physical world, beyond the whole visible world, to what is beyond vision, to what is only seen by the mind's eye. Right? So that's where the soul is mythically or, or metaphorically located at the beginning of its existence. It's contemplating things that are outside of the whole world. So this is like saying the soul starts out uh, outside the cave, right? up in that world of light. Right? It has to be dragged down into the cave and, and chained up, and that's birth. Right? So the, the identity, the nature of the soul is such that it is not made of material stuff. Right? It's not made of bodily stuff. It's somehow kin to these intelligible forms, which are not made of stuff at all, right? They're not material. It belongs there with them. It feeds on contemplation or vision of these forms, intellectual vision, the vision of the mind's eye. And that means, then, that it doesn't like getting into the world of bodies. It's not natural. Something has to go wrong in order for the soul to get into the world of bodies. Birth is, as it were, a mistake or what Plato will call a fall. And one, this is one of these deep ideas in the Western tradition. The soul gets into bodies by falling from that heavenly place into the world of bodies. Um, in Plato's myth of the fall, what happens is the soul gets tired. Um, it's actually, the soul is pictured as a charioteer and the, the horses are, are, are rather hard to manage and the soul gets tired and falls down and, and, and tumbles down and, and ends up in bodies where it doesn't really belong and therefore has to sort of work its way back through a series of transmigrations. So the mythology gets kind of complicated at this point. But the key notion is that the soul starts out outside the body and that its entrance into the body is a fall, a descent, right? The opposite movement from the ascent from the cave up to the world of light. So this up and down movement is really crucial. The up movement is toward the disembodied, immaterial, eternal world. The down movement is the movement of the fall from the eternal world into this changing world of bodies and mortality and death. That also explains, Plato thinks, why we fall in love. Think about love now a minute. Especially think about the experience of falling in love. Think about the wildness of it. Think about the desire for something ultimate, which is somehow part of the experience of falling in love, right? Somehow the experience of falling in love is a hint at some ultimate fulfillment that is wildly beyond anything in this world. Right? Now, some, some, sometimes you think that, that this one person over here in flesh and blood can satisfy that desire, but Plato thinks they can't, really, this, this person that you're falling in love with, whoever it is. The person you fall in love with, the physical, especially the, the physical sight of them, is at best a reminder of what you saw when you weren't in the body. Physical beauty is a reminder of eternal beauty, and eternal beauty is, again, the beauty of the forms. In fact, beauty, capital B, is another name for the good, capital G. Right? The good is, in one aspect of it, the beautiful. And what love is, is our response to beauty. Right? All love, Plato thinks, is directed to something beautiful. We cannot, literally cannot, love what is ugly. Right? You can't fall in love with something if you think it's ugly and horrible. So when you fall in love, what's happening is that the sight of someone else, or maybe, perhaps, your knowledge of their soul, their character, who they are, not just their body, is reminding you of eternal beauty. If you're, um, you know, kind of low-down materialistic sort, maybe it's the sight of someone's body that's reminding you of eternal beauty. But if you're a noble sort, like Socrates, maybe it's the sight of someone's soul, right? Socrates would, as it were, seduce young men into talking philosophy with him. He would take them outside the city wall, they'd sit under trees, and they, and instead of doing what Greeks often did, which was, you know, homosexual affairs. Because the Greeks were, were Greeks thought that, that, that noble sexuality was homosexual because it was with, between noble people, namely men. 
right? Um, the sex with women was for, for reproduction, sex with men was for uh, companionship. Well, Socrates would, would go out with a young man, and this would be the typical sort of um, uh, seduction sort of phenomena, but then he would seduce them into talking philosophy, right? And the result would be that, that you would have a perception of the beauty of a soul. And Socrates would perceive the beauty of the young man's soul, his virtues. And so the young man would also, in fact, fall in love with Socrates. There's a famous picture of Alcibiades, one of the great black sheep of Athens, falling in love with Socrates, right? Falling in love with who he is. Not because Socrates wasn't a beautiful man, right? He's an ugly man, as a matter of fact. But there's something beautiful about his soul, something beautiful about who he is. That reminds you of something eternal, an eternal beauty. So, for instance, the, the virtue of a young man touches your heart because it reminds you of the sight of true virtue which you had before you were ever embodied. So falling in love is this reminiscence, this reminder of a, a true vision of true beauty in the disembodied state. And so I've been talking about the descent, the fall, but then there's this ascent, the climbing up, which we saw in the allegory of the cave. It's also in the symposium another one of Plato's dialogues. The original symposium means drinking party, in fact, in Greek. Um, it's, 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 it's changed meaning in, in the academic world of today. But the original meaning was, it was a drinking party. And the symposium was a bunch of guys getting together and talking about sex. They were talking about falling in love and what happens when an older man falls in love with a younger man. right? And Socrates in that dialogue tries to convince these guys that what's really happening is they're being reminded of true virtue and true beauty and that the, the, the noble lover gets beyond bodily things, you know, the attraction to the young man, and gets to love of the soul and then to love of the city, right, and just laws, right? So, so you're ascending from bodily beauty to love of the virtues of a, an individual soul to love of the city and just laws and a just constitution, and finally you ascend to love of eternal justice and beauty and goodness. Right? That's the original form of what we call platonic love. Right? It was platonic because it wasn't uh, fundamentally sexual, and yet it started at sex. It started with this, uh, this sort of um, imitation of seduction, which happens all the time in Plato's dialogues. You have Socrates uh, accosting a young man in this way that, that any Athenian would have thought was sort of suspicious. Uh, they're off they go outside the city to sit under a tree in the Phaedrus, uh, under a plane tree, uh, and have a private little tete-a-tete. -tete. But they're talking philosophy. Socrates is seducing the young man into love of eternal beauty. And that means, you see, that love becomes a means of ascent, a means of the soul climbing out of the cave. After all, why are we inquiring about the good? Right? Not because we have to, not because we're told we must, but because we desire it, we long for it. Right? So the, the whole motive which drives Socratic inquiry or Platonic inquiry or metaphysics, right, that whole desire for the deep and true being of things is a form of love, a form of eros. And falling in love, the, the sort of fundamental bodily, bodily and psychological experience of falling in love is this recollection of that original vision and love which sort of spreads through our whole body and soul. Now, one of the things that's going on as Plato gets a little older and, and as he writes more is he, he'll start with a very simple and radical idea like the idea of the forms or the idea of this soul-body dualism in the Phaedo. And then he has to make it more complicated because this, is, this otherworldliness especially is too simple um, so, for instance, in the symposium, he says, well, what place does love of bodies have? Right? It's not like the love of bodies has no connection with the higher world. It's a reminiscence of eternal beauty. So you can start with loving what you see with your physical eyes and then ascend to loving a person's soul and then the city and then finally eternal beauty. Well, another thing that happens as Plato goes on as he um, works through his ideas, is he makes the concept of the soul a bit more complicated. Uh, it's no longer just um, one soul and then the body. Right? Um, in the Phaedo, Plato insists the soul is simple, just one thing. It can't be broken up into parts. It can't be scattered on the wind like the breath. 
But in his later works, and especially in the Fidrus and the Republic, he ends up making the notion of the soul more complicated. He suggests that the soul comes in three parts. It's not, not a simple thing, right? It's, it, simple means ha having no parts. It's a, it's a complicated thing. It's got three parts. And this, um, this corresponds to something that happens to the city in the Republic. But let me start with the, um, the image in the Phaedrus. In the Phaedrus, remember, the soul is up there, up in heaven, looking out beyond the whole visible world to, to the world of the forms. And I suggested, I mentioned, that the soul is compared to a charioteer. The charioteer has two horses that he has to control. So the soul actually has three parts. There's the charioteer, and there's, then there's the two horses. There's a good horse who always obeys what the charioteer wants him to do. Right? Then there's an unruly horse who, who's sort of hard to control. Now, the charioteer himself represents something like reason. Right? And that had been the only part of the soul that Plato was concerned with in the Phaedo. Right? The part of the soul that's most akin to the forms. But in the Phaedrus, you've got not just reason, but you've got these two horses. Um, one could be called the spirited part of the soul. Spirited in the sense of um, a spirited horse. Not in the sense of spirit or, or breath but spirit in the sense of um, a spirited horse, a horse with fine uh, courage, actually, becomes the, the key element in a soldier. But imagine also a battle, a, 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 a war horse, right? the, the sort of spirit of a war horse. It's obedient, strong, not as smart as the charioteer, but uh, will obey the charioteer. The other horse is more lustful, sort of driven by desires driven by impulses, and it keeps on going this way and that way, depending on what it happens to see. And so the charioteer ends up getting tired, and this, this, this lustful or desirous or appetitive, right, a horse with great appetites, uh, this, this appetitive horse makes it difficult for the charioteer to keep the chariot under control, and he gets tired, and that's when the fall happens in the tumble. Now, there's another version of this three-part soul, and that's in the Republic. Here... We can explain the, the whole thing a bit more clearly, I think. You've got the highest part of the soul, the rational part of the soul. That's like the charioteer. You've got a middle part of the soul located in the chest. Uh, Plato actually locates it in the liver. That's the word, uh, thumos. Um, but we can think of it as the heart, the soldier part. Right? Um, in fact, the soldiers in Plato's Republic are the ones who are predominantly um, keyed to this part of the soul, the spirited part. And then there's the appetitive part. Think of every part of your body below your chest. The gut and all those other things which you don't want to talk about or think about too much. All those locations of desire, hunger, appetite, etc., etc. All those things which are likely to make you go astray. All those things which drive commerce and business. <laughs> That's for Plato, right? Um, Plato thinks that the people who are into business are into desire. Right? The economy and, and buying and selling is all about satisfying our physical needs, all those needs that are, come from the, 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 sort of the, uh, the chest on down. That's the, the majority of people in, in the world, right? They are related to that lowest part of the soul. Right? Uh, at one place in the Republic, he compares them to a many-headed beast. Right? Whereas the, um, the middle part of the soul, the spirited part, is like a lion. And the highest part of the soul is the the, the man within us, the human being within us, the inner man, you could translate it. So those three parts of the soul, the man, the lion, the many-headed beast, are, um, c correspond to three classes in the city of the Republic. There's the philosopher king, who's the, the rational part of the Republic, as it were. There's the guardians or soldiers, who are the spirited part, who obey the orders of the philosopher king. And then there's the unruly masses, Hoi poloi, which is Greek for the many, right, the masses, um, they have their function, right? You've got to have people growing the food and buying and selling. That's, that's, that's part of it. That's part of your soul. You've got to eat and all that sort of stuff. But they ought to be obedient to the higher powers. And there are various ways that the higher powers ought to be in control, and when they're not, things go wrong in the city. And likewise, when desire runs rampant in us, things go wrong in our souls and in our lives. But notice what, what has changed. Here, the thing that goes wrong is not the body. The thing that goes wrong is the lower part of the soul. The source of, of evil, the source of, of our problems, is not the body, but this lower, more bodily-oriented part of the soul. And that gives us a more complex picture. It's not just the pure soul and the dirty body. It's 
the soul, which is a complex unity which needs to be ordered in a certain way and governed in a certain way, and it sometimes gets ungoverned. And how that government is supposed to go is a major theme of the Republic.